out to you individually with answers at a later date. We also have live captioning in Spanish for the duration of the town hall. To enable live captioning in Zoom, select the CC icon at the bottom of your screen for closed captioning services. Now I'm going to toss it to my colleague, Mershai Salu, via Zoom, who will be moderating questions there on Zoom. Mershai, to you. Thank you, Jordan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I think she's muted. Thanks, Mershai. Can you hear me? Okay, it looks like we're... Can you hear me, Jordan? Okay, I think we're having some technical difficulties there via Zoom. Okay. For now, I'm going to go ahead, while we figure out what's going on to Zoom, I'm going to go ahead and toss it to Council President Glass so he can give some opening remarks, and then we'll hear intros from each council member. Council President Glass, to you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I know the weather uh, has not been helpful, but I appreciate all of you for braving it and coming out to have a, uh, an important conversation with us. Uh, this is the second town hall that this council has organized. Our first was in Gaithersburg a few months ago, and tonight we're here in the greater Wheaton, Glenmont area, uh, because we wanna make sure that we, we go to every corner of the county and make sure we talk to as many residents as possible. That's really what tonight is all about. Uh, and it's about you, it's about the conversation, and allowing us to hear what is on your mind. Not only those of you who are in the room, uh, but also those of us uh, who are those of you who are joining us on Zoom. And thank you very much for spending your evening uh, both here and virtually. Um, like most of the town halls that we have, uh, we want to have as many questions and conversations as possible. So we will ask that uh, people have one question uh, per topic, and I ask my colleagues also that as we go through the questions, uh, we try to be brief so that we can engage uh, in as many conversations and hear as many point of views as well. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Jordan so that we can uh, get this started. Great, thank you so much. Um, we can go ahead and get started with questions that I don't know if we have Zoom. And Jordan, uh, yes. pardon me, if we could just do introductions oh, yes. and we can start with okay. Council Member Katz. And yes, then Council just Member Katz. Yes. Is this on? Yes, it's yes. on. Okay. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here in person and on Zoom. I'm Sidney Katz. I'm the County Council Member for the 3rd District, which pretty much is the municipal boundaries of Rockville, Gaithersburg, and Washington Grove. There's a little bit beyond, but not much beyond. I uh, am the chair of the Public Safety Committee. I'm on the Government Operations Committee, and I'm the former mayor of Gaithersburg. Great. Uh, <laughs> Council Member Jawando, to you. Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Council Member Will Jawando. I'm at large member of the County Council. I'm in my second term. At large is fancy for you represent the whole county. And I chair our Education and Culture Committee and I uh, serve on the planning, uh, I was about to say housing economic development, planning, housing and parks committee, uh, and native Silver Spring resident, civil rights attorney, and good to see everybody tonight. Thank you. Great, hi everyone, I'm Kate Stewart. I'm the county council member for District 4. District 4 includes North Bethesda, Kensington, Garrett Park, uh, parts of Chevy Chase, Tacoma Park and Silver Spring pretty much uh, in the inside the Beltway. I have the privilege of chairing the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, and I serve on the Transportation and Environment Committee. In addition to that, this year I have the uh, honor to be the chair of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Board. That is a regional body of 24 jurisdictions in the DMV area, so I get to work collaboratively with colleagues in Virginia, D.C., and other parts of Maryland on issues issues that impact us regionally, and I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I have the great honor of being the council member for this area, District 6, which is anything between Forest Glen and Aspen Hill, including Wheaton, Kenmill, uh, Rockville, parts of Rockville, parts of 
Kensington and so on. Uh, I am the chair of the Economic Development Committee for the County Council, and I am a member of the Housing, Parks, and Planning Committee. I am very excited to see so many people here today, and I'm glad it's raining, so I'm going to say that. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marilyn Balcom. I am the district representative for District 2, which is Germantown, Clarksburg, Poolsville, North North Potomac and Darnstown, Boyd's area, uh, much of the Ag Reserve, so uh, we're very happy that it's raining. We need the rain. And uh, I just wanted to say happy summer. I think it's appropriate that on the longest day of the year, we're spending it with you. Good evening. I am Andrew Friedson. I represent District 1 on the County Council, which is Bethesda, Chevy Chase, and Potomac. Uh, I have the privilege and honor currently of serving as the Vice President of the County Council. I chair the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee and serve on the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee. Uh, good evening again, everybody. Evan Glass, and in addition to serving as President of the Council this year, I also chair the Transportation and Environment Committee, and I also serve on the Economic Development Committee. Hello, everybody. Um, today is the first day of summer, although it doesn't feel like that outside. But uh, my name is Gabe Albornoz. I'm one of your four at-large members of the County Council. I chair the County's Health and Human Services Committee. I also serve on the Education and Culture Committee. And I live in Kensington. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lorian Sales, and I'm honored to serve as your at-large council member, former Gaithersburg City Council member, and I serve on the Health and Human Services Committee and the Economic Development Committee, our newest committee. Um, and I was also recently named the lead for eliminating disparities in public health. So very happy to be here with you all this evening, and I live in the city of Gaithersburg. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kristen Mink. I'm the council member for District 5, uh, which is East County, so Burtonsville, on down through Stonegate, Hillendale, Fairland, White Oak, Colesville, all the way down through Four Corners, and it also loops out west to include Leisure World. Uh, I serve on the Education and Culture Committee and the Public Safety Committee, and I'm also the lead for libraries. Glad to be with you tonight. Today is my half birthday because I was born on the shortest day of the year, December 21st, and yet my name is Dawn, and I am Dawn Ludke, and I represent Council District Number 7. District 7 includes Olney, Ashton, Sandy Spring, Brookville, Laytonsville, Damascus, Montgomery Village, and Durwood. I have the other half of the Ag Reserve along with Council Member Balcom, so I too am excited about the rain, but I also have one metro stop at Shady Grove. Um, I serve on the Public Safety and Health and Human Services Committees, and I also serve as the Council's Lead for Crisis Response. And in my extracurriculars, as, as they like to call them, I serve on the Criminal Justice Coordinating Commission, the Human Trafficking Prevention Commission, and the Board of Social Services. Great, thank you so much all council members for those wonderful intros. Uh, we were having some technical difficulties via Zoom, but I'm gonna go ahead and toss back to my colleague, Mershai Salu, who will be moderating questions via Zoom. Mershai, to you. Thank you, Jordan, can you hear me now? Okay, we're still having technical difficulties with that, but that's okay. Now that we heard the intros, I'm gonna go ahead and start to take questions from residents if they have them. By a show of hands, we'll be taking questions here in person and then also via Zoom. So a show of hands here, okay, I see you. How are you? You can stand up, I'll hold the mic. If you can, if not, I can, I can give you the mic. That's okay, you can stay seated if you'd like. Okay, it's fine. You sure? Okay. You can tell me your name, I'll hold the mic for you, you can say your question. I'm Martha Jenkins. I have lived in Montgomery County my whole life. Um, and I hope that you will look at me as not a handicapped elderly person that's passe. I'm here to impart a lot of wisdom. Um, I thank you very much for opening up this opportunity for all of us to come and visit with you and give you our heart. Because I've lived here long enough to have seen times when things were calm and peaceful and there was very little crime to what we're seeing today, which is very frightening to me as a person that 
could be very vulnerable out on the streets. So I'm here to talk about crime. And I want to give you a little short history lesson. Thousands of years ago, God gave the Jewish people the land of Israel. And they flourished and they prospered until they decided that God was passe, that they didn't need him anymore. They could stand on their own two feet, and they stopped worshiping him. And you know what happened to them? They were conquered and enslaved for 70 years by the Babylonians. But God, after those 70 years, had mercy on them and brought them back to their land where they continued to flourish until, again, they decided they didn't need God, and they discarded him. And I fear that's what's happened to us. We have taken God out of the public square. We no longer revere him. We no longer teach his Ten Commandments to our population as a whole, but particularly to our young people. And we have generations that don't have a clue that the God told us, do not steal, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not lie. And here we are embracing lies as truth. That's very sad. And so my view is that God has taken his hand off of Montgomery County, Maryland, and our whole country. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? Um, we just have, thank you. I do. Um, I appreciate all that you all have done to put resources in our schools, in our police, in our houses of worship, cameras, everything that you've done. And it's certainly improved situations in a lot of places. But it's not the answer. The answer is changing man's heart from evil to good. And my question to you is, only God can do that, and my question to you is, I would ask you to be the cutting edge counsel that you propose to be, and brave and strong to save this, this county, and eventually the whole country, by instilling God back on his throne in this country. <laughs> in this county, because without it, we are doomed. Ms. Jenkins, thank, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that comment and question. As a Jew myself, thank you for taking me back to Sunday school uh, for a brief history lesson. And one of the things I learned in Sunday school, but more importantly, things I learned in public school was the separation of church and state. And I very much revere our constitutional separation of church and state. That's one of the reasons I've chosen to live here uh, and why I'm proud to be uh, an elected official uh, here in Montgomery County in the state of Maryland and in this United States. And I will also say that one of the things I am most proud of is the beautiful diversity in Montgomery County. We are one of the most diverse counties in the entire country. The three most diverse communities in the country are here in Montgomery County, Germantown, Gaithersburg and Silver Spring, the top three most diverse communities in the country. And the reason they're diverse is because we have people from all across the country, all across the world, people who speak multiple languages, people who practice different religions. And I respect those differences. I appreciate our diversity. I'm, I appreciate you choosing to live here for the long time that you have. I hope you will continue living here and celebrating our diversity, but also celebrating our Constitution and the separation of church and state. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you for your question. I just add, uh, we have also, in addition to everything the Council President just said, which I agree with, you know, we've worked really hard, our school board, the council, the county, to respect every resident and the as you know the you know the first amendment to the constitution uh, does not call for the establishment of any religion but it also allows for the free exercise of every religion and and and, and we've made progress in our schools for example just even last year and in, in holidays for other religions um, and so that's part of the respect of free exercise and I think that's a good thing um, but 
uh, appreciate your perspective, and we're going to continue to be welcoming for everyone here. Great. Thank you so much, council members. We'll be taking another question from um, some people here in the audience. Hi, sir. How are you? You can come on out to the aisle here. I'll hold this mic for you. You can tell me your name and your question in a concise manner. I'll hold the mic for right here. Thank you. My name is Daniel Plaxen. Um, I'm a resident of Wien. I also am from Brinklow, which is north of Ashton. Um, last, a couple weeks ago, we had a university bike path or bike lane meeting. I do believe you were there. When is the follow-up meet? It's a two-parter because this is as important as it is. When is the follow-up meeting? One, two. I was told that. Not only bikers, pedestrians, emergency vehicles, bus path is in the same lane as well as wheelchairs. How is the wheelchair going to get off the curb when the emergency vehicle or bus is going to go through? One, two, are they going to run over the wheelchair? because they have no way of getting out of that lane. And didn't it not work the first time you guys put it on? Uh, Great. Thank you answer. for your question. Okay. Thank you for the question. So there are, two, there are three different issues in that question. Number one, the planning department, and I see some staff members here, uh, they're working on the University Boulevard Corridor Plan right now. They're working on a draft. That meeting that was at if it's the same one that we're talking about last week at the Parking Planning Commission, that was on the University Corridor Master Plan. That plan is going to come to the county council next year. So right now it's just a draft. Um, there is follow-up meetings, and I, if I can have your email, I can send to you the list of the next meetings so you can have. So that's one part. The, sec the second part, you spoke about the uh, bus lanes. That's a, that's a project that DOT, uh, Department of Transportation, is doing with SHA, which is the state highway. Uh, University Boulevard is a state road. So what the DOT and SHA is doing, which is separate from the University Boulevard Corridor Master Plan, and I know it's confusing because it's the same area. They're planning to have a pilot program with buses right now. Uh, they, their first proposal was buses with bicycles, not wheelchairs. Uh, buses with bicycles on that particular lane where it used to be a pilot for bicycles that was actually done by SHA, no the county council, um, and that, well, that pilot was there for like six months and then it went away, and now they're going to try it with buses and see how it works. In my opinion, and I know I'm not going to be popular here, in my opinion, that lane, dedicated lane, should only be for buses because I do think danger of having bicycles and buses on the same lane at the same time. I don't agree with that, and I already voiced my concern with DOT, but that's just me. Um, and then, so wait, you talk about the University Boulevard Corridor Master Plan, the, the pilot bicycle lane that is gone, and now the bus lane, and, it, and I clarified that wheelchairs are not on that lane. It's just for buses. And again, POT said buses and bicycles. I think it should just, just only be buses, and they haven't made their final decision. Uh, I hope that answered that question. Um, I have a follow-up question. Oh. You yes, specifically said I can hold the mic. The guy in charge of it said wheelchairs and bicycles because two wheelchair people were insistent on it. Oh, okay, so if they said that is because they had the some, some sidewalks on. Okay, thank you. Some places where the sidewalk is, they're so bad that people in wheelchair, and this happened when the pilot for the bicycles happened last year, you, you will see people in wheelchairs using that lane, but that's because it was only for bicycle. Now that they're placing buses, we, wheelchair users are not going to use that lane. That is extremely dangerous. Um, and I'm, I'm actually saying the bicycles shouldn't be on that lane anyway. So I'm with you there, and I'm more than happy to continue following it up. Was it your mom that I talked to? Yeah, I remember you. Um, <laughs> you we are going to have a follow-up meeting with your mom and neighbors, and I promised her that once you guys selected a date, which I think the, um, uh, what's his name, Luis from planning, who's not here, but I see his boss here. Um, 
agree that once the date is set, I promised them that I was gonna canvas with my team and Jose's right there from my office in the neighborhood so more people will come to that one-on-one -on -one and have these conversations in that community to clarify all these issues. At the end of the day, I am committed to make sure that my community is safe for people to walk, bike, roll, take transit, and drive. We're gonna make it happen, and having your input is key, and clarifying issues is key, Otherwise, we're just gonna be talking in circles. And uh, that's it. Uh, yes, sir, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez will be in touch. We will take one more question here in the room and then we're gonna toss it back to Zoom. I see somebody over here. I'll be back over to you guys in a moment, all right? How you doing, sir? I'll hold this for you. If you can keep your question concise, that'll be great. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me this chance. Uh, I don't know what you see before. Uh, I don't expect uh, when you have a meeting uh, this much number of uh, participants. I see 189 on the screen as well. And you can see behind me how many person is coming. Uh, previously, I never go any town hall meeting like this because everything goes smooth and I was happy. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mazmur. Uh, and I'm uh, a head priest for one of EOTC church in Kensington and I serve in the church uh, for, uh, for my religion, it's not for my work. Uh, I serve in the community, but uh, my career, in my career I'm a licensed professional engineer. Uh, my, my daughters, they go in the Montgomery schools from elementary to high schools. My fear is now, what I saw is MCPS, they are uh, taking away the parent rights to opt out for the curriculum or for the books or what they are going to learn. When I see that, I have read. We teach children in the, school, in the church. Families, they teach their children in the house. When they go to school, they teach them something else, which is different from what they learn from their family, from their church, and they may be confused, or they will be confused, definitely. Confusion is the first step to be uh, crazy or to lose their mind. I hear uh, one of the counselor here when he says about the First Amendment which is the basic for this country, for all of us, which is very nice, and we'll uh, try to have it everywhere in the world. But how, how can these families, or our, how can we uh, teach our children to live with anybody in the school without losing their religious right? So can you please uh, return back our religious right. This is a religion. They said last time, it, they do it, they, they do the, this based on science. Science we know it. We are in the science. So maybe science will be changed after 10, five years. So please, let's have our right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you for attending this evening. I'll turn it over to the chair of the Education and Culture Committee since you asked about MCPS. Uh, appreciate the question. Uh, I, I will refer to my previous statement that there should be no establishment of religion. There should be free exercise of religion. Obviously, you talked about that in your, in your statement. Uh, the school board decides school board policy. Um, they make a decision about what is taught in the schools, what is not taught in the schools. Uh, it was previously mentioned we are a beautifully diverse county in so many ways, and we are an accepting county of everyone, uh, and that's the goal of Montgomery County. I think we stand out at a time where people are working really hard to divide people in this country. And uh, so, from a, tech, from a technical aspect, I think, you know, we have, just so you know, we have no control, this body, over what is taught in the school system. That is the school board who's elected on their own. That being, that being said, um, I am supportive of, of their decision um, to make sure that they are teaching about the full breadth and diversity of every person 
uh, and the rights of every person that lives in this community. Um, while I, at the same time, respect your right, as, as a Christian, I teach things at home to my children that are not taught in the schools, that I expect them to listen to and abide by, uh, and that is our right as parents. And, and I'm glad that you have that right. Great, thank you. And uh, Jordan, if, if I, I would just like to add, I, I understand the question, uh, and I appreciate the response uh, from, from the chair of the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, but for me, this is uh, personal as well. Uh, I am the first openly gay member of the Montgomery County Council. And just like in the previous question, I talked about our constitutional rights uh, with separation of church and state. Um, marriage equality is law of the land. And our school community is full of children who have many different families. Some children have a mom and a dad. Some children live with a grandmother. Some live with aunties. Some are adopted. Some live with foster parents. And yes, some have two mommies or two daddies. These are constitutionally protected rights. These are our neighbors. And all we're doing is having conversations about our community. And so I think that we just have to be mindful of the beautiful diversity that we have here and making sure that everyone's constitutional rights are protected. Great, thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and toss it to Zoom now. Looks like we have everything under control. So I'm gonna go ahead and toss it to my colleague, Mershai Salu, who will moderate questions via Zoom. Mershai, to you. Thank you, Jordan. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> thank you, okay. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. I apologize for the technical um, difficulties earlier. I will be moderating questions for our residents that are attending virtually this evening. Please, please indicate all your questions in the Q&A feature, and I will call on your name. When you write your question, also please indicate whether or not you would like to ask your questions live. Keep in mind that for those asking uh, their questions live, in order to limit any technical glitches, we are only uh, allowing live questions to be asked through audio. When I call on your name, the host will send you a request to unmute your microphone and you may proceed to ask your question. For those calling in, use your phone's dial pad to press star six, which will mute and unmute your microphone. We will try to get through as many virtual questions as possible this evening. If you don't get uh, to your question this evening, please continue to note them in the Q&A feature and the council will get back to you. Please note that if we experience any difficult um, technical difficulties, we will do our best to re remedy them in a timely manner. I'm now going to toss it over to my colleague, Marcela Rodriguez for Spanish translations. Thank you so much, Mershai. Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches a todos. Este programa se está traduciendo al español para los participantes en la plataforma de Zoom. Los que deseen acceder a este recurso lo pueden hacer seleccionando el botón con las letras CC, el cual lo encontrará en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Muchísimas gracias. Jordan, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Mershai and Marcella. I'm actually gonna toss it back to you guys so we can start taking some questions there via Zoom. What we'll do, guys, is take some questions via Zoom and then we'll come back to you guys in the audience, okay? So, Mershai and Marcella, back to you. Hey, thank you, Jordan. Um, so, our first question comes from Diego Orego from Chevy Chase. Okay, I... I will go ahead and ask the question just in case. Um, just give him a second. Okay, I can go ask the question. Um, he asks, are there any significant updates on purple line construction and has it had any environmental impacts on the Rock Creek waters? Great, whichever council member would like to answer. I'll turn it over to council member Kate Stewart. Great, thank you so much, uh, Diego, for the question uh, regarding the Purple Line construction. As the District 4 representative, who I believe has most of the Purple Line stops <laughs> are close to it, um, I can kick it over to Council Vice President Friedson after this. Um, we actually just um, recently received an update. Um, I was fortunate to hear the Lieutenant Governor um, speak to this uh, regarding an update on the schedule for the Purple Line. Um, so right now, as people 
probably have seen, there's a lot of construction going on. What is happening right now with the Purple Line construction is mostly utilities work. It is moving the utilities. We are about 70% done with that work. So we still have some utility work to do. Um, in addition to that, unfortunately, there's been a leadership change um, with the Purple Line partnership. And what the governor's office and the administration is doing now is assessing where we are with that project. And we've been promised to get an update on the schedule um, this fall. But the work is going to continue on moving the utilities. Uh, we are still hoping that we can stay on schedule um, and moving forward. And I know that all of us here are very dedicated to working with the residents who are impacted as well as the businesses during this difficult time. Thank you. I think she covered it well. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Rashai, I feel like we have another virtual question. You can go ahead and ask that and we'll answer that as well. Thank you. Rashai, to you. Our next um, person that's asking a question is Anita Hardy. Anita, you may ask your question. Hello, um, I've been a resident of Montgomery County for 24 years. Um, I have children and grandchildren who have graduated from high school and college. What I'd like to know is, with all of the building that's going on in this county, what is uh, Montgomery, are there any affordable units for people who don't make six figures? Uh, or people, you know, the first responders, teachers, um, people who don't make that kind of money, and then they are, they have to buy, and they have to take a housing unit that is very expensive, and they end up not being able to stay in the county. In the county. So, and also, are the developers paying their fair share of the cost to uh, supplement uh, the housing so that so that affordable housing is available? Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very timely question. I'll turn it over to Vice President Friedson, who also chairs the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the question. It's a really good question. So uh, first of all, every new building that's built in Montgomery County uh, has uh, what are called MPDUs, moderately placed dwelling units. Uh, those units are uh, affordable, must be affordable uh, to what's considered to be uh, generally workforce uh, type uh, housing, 65% of area median income uh, uh, to 70% of area median income. Uh, in any of the uh, newer areas where we have rezoned and come up with new master plans and new land use policies, the minimum standard is 15%. Uh, historically, it was 12.5% and actually all of the higher income uh, areas of the county as part of our interest in having mixed income uh, communities, those are all 15% uh, 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 mandatory uh, moderate place uh, dwelling units. Just to, as a, a means of comparison, uh, the District of Columbia has a similar uh, policy, but it's almost half of that uh, requirement, only about 8%. Uh, There's no such policy uh, in uh, Northern uh, Virginia. Those are done on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, we have done a tremendous amount uh, over the last five years on the County Council to address the housing crisis. Uh, just to give a few uh, examples, uh, we have uh, created uh, significant new funding streams for the Housing Opportunities Commission, our public housing agency. We created a $100 million housing production fund, uh, which has become a model all around the country to create mixed income communities. The first project as part of that uh, uh, fund the, the laureate at Shady Grove Metro that Councilmember Lukey, because it's in her district, and I, uh, we were both there. Uh, that has been open. It has uh, deeply affordable units, affordable units, workforce units, and market rate units. It's a true mixed income community as part of a public private partnership with the Housing Opportunities Commission. There will be projects like that through this fund that happen uh, uh, moving forward. There's a, another one coming up in Hillendale, uh, for instance. We have uh, a significant effort uh, to do additional preservation. We created a new fund uh, working with the co uh, county executive uh, to address naturally occurring uh, affordable housing. We're looking at creating another $50 million uh, fund specifically focused on uh, preservation that uh, the council will be taking some steps in the coming weeks to move that forward and uh, ultimately should be 
uh, up and running and live uh, uh, either at the end of this calendar year or the beginning of next calendar year, but during uh, next fiscal year. Uh, so before this time next year, that uh, program uh, will be up and running. We've been partnering with nonprofits and provided uh, 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 greater opportunities for them uh, to do it. Council Member Lorianne Sales and I have a, a, a project uh, and a, a zoning text amendment to be able to provide a, a faster, much, much faster uh, process to build new affordable units if you meet certain affordability thresholds to try to incentivize uh, new affordable uh, housing units. We approved ADUs, accessory dwelling units, to try to provide uh, opportunities for additional uh, people to be able to uh, create opportunities on their land. We're working with uh, the public land that we have uh, to make sure that we prioritize the scarce resource of land that we have on public property and uh, we utilize that land to create more housing so that we can co-locate housing where we have recreation centers and libraries and other uh, public amenities. And we've been moving forward with a number of projects uh, there. And we're actually now uh, launching an effort working with the county executive to work with faith-based organizations. A lot of faith-based organizations have lots of land, sometimes huge surface parking lots, but not necessarily large amounts of money or financial resources, but are mission-based. And they want to be in the affordable housing business, but they need to work with the county to be able to help. And so we're working uh, with them and have a concerted effort uh, to look at how we take advantage of that. And then lastly, we have uh, a way uh, that the county has moved forward to incentivize transit-oriented development at Metro to provide some of the most desirable places that have been surface parking lots for decades. And rather than being parking lots, we can turn those into places for people by building housing on them. We've provided incentives uh, to do that uh, as well. And uh, one of the first projects as part of that effort is at the Grosvenor uh, Metro in uh, Councilmember Stewart's uh, district. And 22% of those units will be affordable. So uh, we have a lot more work to do. We have affordable housing challenges and a housing crisis. Uh, but uh, we are uh, taking historic steps uh, in the county. I think have, we have done more uh, in, in the county over the last five years than any five-year period in the county's history, but uh, we're, we're, we have a lot of catching up to do because we have not built nearly enough housing and nearly enough affordable housing to be able to meet the needs of residents. Uh, Council Member Ludke has a comment. Yep, just a brief comment since uh, Council Member Friedson mentioned the Laureate, which just opened. But um, one of the things that's incredibly important to me about that, not just the, the pri public-private partnership there with our Housing Opportunities Commission and the, and the private developers, but that it was built to be accessible from the get-go and adaptable so it doesn't require retrofitting. So for example, in all of the common spaces, it's fully accessible by anyone who's in a wheelchair or using <laughs> my favorite, the knee rolly, um, or and you know, a walker. And all of the bathrooms are zero entry. So you don't have impediments to being able to, to shower and live in your unit. So if you do have a unit there and something does change in your life, you're not uprooted and not moved. Similar if you need deeply affordable housing and you are able to get a space there and you do have limitations, they will be fully accommodated. Great. Thank you so much, council members. Um, Rashai, thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and take two questions here in person. I see hands up here. We'll get back to you guys. But these people have been waiting as well. How are you guys? You can go ahead and stand up. Are you guys together or? Okay. Okay, so we'll take one question. If you guys can ask one question between the two of you, that'd be great. Who would like to ask? Okay. Okay. So if you have some alert, you can go ahead. Okay, so she'll ask the question for both of you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you. I think I've spoken to some of you in some capacity. My name is Claudia. Um, I have a lifelong resident of Montgomery County. I grew up in Bethesda. Um, I went to school in the Northeast. I came back and I served um, as a school teacher in our schools through the pandemic. I'm trying not to get emotional about it because I saw the conditions in our schools and especially some of our, you know, even ones that looked more well-funded, even with CARES Act funding, were not getting appropriate resources and materials delivered. Now, I live in District 6. I live by Shriver Elementary School right up the street. And looking at the plan that was proposed and looking at the numbers of, um, the proposed capacities of our schools in 2025 shows it being a utilization number under 
I live at Shriver, by Shriver across the street. There are portables all across the back. We have students who are not getting their needs served, both across the school in many ways. My question is, with the decrease in the taxing, what are we going to do to end the reduction in CARES Act funding? What are we doing to truly fund our local schools? I'm worried that with the development of new things on Georgia Avenue and in our community with local housing, that we are not going to properly put in what we need to do for our schools. And I say that as a teacher and community member. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, for, you. thank you for the question, Claudia. I'll turn it over to Council Member Mink. Thank you so much for being a teacher, first of all. Um, it's, it's not an easy choice, and, uh, and, I, and I deeply appreciate your work there. Um, I agree with you. I, I have a lot of concerns about uh, about the funding that went through. That's why I was I, I voted against the budget, and this that was that was one of the main reasons. That said, we were in a very tight. It, realistically, it was a very tight budget. We're in a difficult time. We're losing a lot of grant funding. It, it was not an easy process, you know, for for any of us. Um, and I think all of us do have an eye to the future and how we're going to try to deal with that. And that's something that. All of us are going to be looking at over over the next year. So voices like yours are important. Um, and um, I'll, I'll note that as we look at how the Board of Education is dealing with the budget, um, they have noted that they are having to move some of their operational expenses onto ESSER funding, which is the federal grant funding, and it runs out in a year. And those inclu that includes things like you know social workers, for instance, uh, things that are going to be recurring costs, uh, you know curriculum costs, things that we of course are going to want to continue to fund, and so. So we are going to have to be working as a body to come up with solutions and figure out what we're going to do um, next year. So um, I, I completely agree with you that it's uh, we're in a it's been a very very tight situation and it's continuing to be a tight situation. Um, you know, it's a it was a balance between how much we could raise taxes uh, and 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 levy that burden on the public versus what the output was. My take was that we. Um, we should have gone a little bit more, um, but that said, it was going to be tight regardless, and we're in a point now where we're looking towards what is the solution going to be and figuring out what are the musts for the school system as well as in other areas that we need to be um, that we need to, to to make sure we are able to fund next year. And so this is going to be a year of figuring out um, can can we get creative with how we are able to um, to find savings, how we are able to streamline things, um, new sources of revenue. Um, we are absolutely all aware that next year is going to be even tougher, and we have to find uh, solutions that we that we have not yet been able to find. And, and, and Councilmember Mink answered the question with regard to the operating budget. Uh, your question also uh, in, uh, asked about the capital budget and the infrastructure. Uh, and Councilmember Mink did introduce a, a, a bill that provides hundreds of millions of dollars more for school construction. And I'll turn it over to Councilmember uh, Stewart to provide a response to that part. Great, and I um, I want to say thank you very much, and also thank you uh, for being a teacher in our community. Um, and one of the things that um, I was very proud of that this uh, council was able to do this year was close the gap we were facing on excuse, on uh, capital projects. So for school funding, when we started the budget, we were looking at uh, over a two hundred million dollar deficit, and a lot of projects were going to be delayed. But what we did was work together to pass a record change our recordation tax, and what that does is a one time. Um, tax when you buy or sell a home, and um, Council Member Mink in, and Joando introduced it, working together with the colleagues, um, I was able to amend that to make it a bit more progressive so that it did not touch people who were purchasing starter homes, things like townhomes or condominiums or detached homes um, that are under $600,000. And so we were able to make it more progressive and able to close the gap in the funding that we had for school construction projects. So those school construction projects are going to be able to stay on time and not get delayed. The other piece of this is that there's also dedicated funding for um, evictions um, and to help people there. 
And so we will have now 10 to about $11 million each year moving forward in dedicated funding to help people stay in their homes. And so, um, and I will say just to go back on the operating, what we did pass, and I think this was unanimous of everyone on this council, was a clear message to the school board that we wanted to fund the teachers' contracts because paying our teachers and our educators and our staff is incredibly important to this council. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, council members. We'll take another question here in person, and then we will make our way to Zoom. We have a lot of people here in the audience, so I'm going to go over to this side for the first time. Gentlemen here, how are you? You can go ahead and stand, and I'll hold the mic for you, okay? No problem. My name is Emmanuel Walker. Um, I've been in Silver Spring, well, Montgomery County, for about 10 years now. Um, I'm a renter. I wanted to know, well, like maybe four months ago, our rent went up almost 11 percent and we were forced to pretty much leave at that point we were looking at maybe Howard County going down to Clinton somewhere outside of where we couldn't afford to live anymore um, thankfully they made a mistake on their paperwork and they didn't give us enough notice so they had to like take that 10 percent back so we were able to negotiate like a livable um, amount of increase but I wanted to know like what can we do to help protect against that happening outside of just them making that mistake because I know a lot of my neighbors now have papers on their door saying that they need to leave and they can't afford to stay and they didn't have the luxury of the management making a mistake so that they could keep their houses and they've been in Montgomery County longer than I have and to um, a part of me trying to stay in Montgomery County has been seeking work and I've come from D.C. where there were a lot of different programs to help you get training, um, seek education for like adults and things like that. In Montgomery County, it wasn't as many programs, but thankfully I was able to find some. And the ones that I were able to enroll in, they're doing the exact opposite of what anything I've experienced that make me feel supported, like I can actually benefit from the programs they rush you out they don't want to give you the benefits they don't want to give you the funding it, it's, it's just feeling like they're doing it just to have numbers of people to show but not actually support what can we do about it and how can that be changed uh, th thank you thank you for that question right right now at the council there are two pieces of legislation that have been introduced uh, that aim to uh, safeguard renters they are different uh, and so I'm going to uh, invite Councilmember Juwando to talk about his bill, uh, and then also Councilmember Natalie Fani Gonzalez to talk after. Thank you, uh, and appreciate the question. And, and we want you to stay here in Silver Spring and, and in Montgomery County. And I hope I'm going to go back backwards order. Uh, we're hopefully you're aware of WorkSource Montgomery, uh, which is our workforce development agency. Uh, they they do great work. They have a one-stop shop in Wheaton. Um, on George Avenue, so if you're not aware of that, okay, good, 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 good. And we can always improve. I mean, we, uh, you know, part of being in Montgomery County and anywhere in the world is being able to say, you know, we do some things okay, but we need to get better. So we'd love to, f we can follow up with you. My chief of staff will give you her card and we'll follow up with you on any specifics because I'd love to, you know, work with you to take those back. Um, Council Member Mink and I introduced the Home Act, uh, which you, we had some people, you probably heard about it walking in tonight. Um, I, I certainly did. They asked me to support my own bill. Um, and, uh, but what it would do, uh, and we're having good discussions in, on the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee, which I sit on with Council Member Friedson and Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, uh, to the good news is, you know, and I had authored two bills to freeze, to, to freeze increases during the pandemic. Now we are at a place where we will the majority of this council, and I'm going to be positive, we all agree that we need to protect renters from exorbitant increases, and we agree on that. So that's the good news. The question is, what's the level and what are the details? Um, and we're working through that on the committee. We had our first session last week. We have our next session on these bills on Monday. Uh, I am very confident and, and going to work with colleagues to make sure we come to a place that uh, protects renters in a significant way. Um, Council Member Stewart mentioned the funding for rental assistance. We've done a lot, record numbers uh, on that end to make sure people have assistance to stay in their homes, but it, you, it's an important thing that we make sure that people can stay in their homes from these increases. And we have almost 40% of our county that rents. Uh, that's hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and even if, while most landlords are doing 
normal increases, even if a small percentage are doing high increases, that's thousands of people. And uh, in our county, Department of Housing considers a 10% increase to be constructive eviction, the same as saying you got to go. And so we're going to have to have a reasonable cap at a number that allows for stability for you as the renter, but also predictability and a fair return for the landlord. And I'm confident that we can get there. Our numbers are apart in the two bills. We had a 3% cap. Uh, the other bill had a much, much higher cap, and we're going to try to figure something out so that it can be reasonable. Something very quickly, um, and, and I'm going to repeat what uh, Councilmember Wiljawando said, and I agree completely. Uh, I would just add two things. One is, uh, I'm, as a chair of the Economic Development Committee, I see you over there, um, a big focus on job creation in Montgomery County, but jobs that pay a living wage. That's a huge focus of mine in my committee. Uh, we have a series of work sessions coming up, uh, including with War Source Development, and I do want to hear from you. Uh, your feedback, um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, just because I have the mic, and I'm just gonna say this very quickly, uh, it relates to housing. Um, today was a great day, especially in my district. About five minutes from here, I was working um, with the county executive, Mark Elrich. Uh, we purchased yesterday, and we had the press conference today, so you'll see the news tomorrow. Um, we were able to purchase an apartment building uh, with 345 units. Basically, long story short, in this particular area, again, five minutes from here, um, immigrant women, because they were all women and immigrants, contacted me in December, like two days after I, I jumped on office, telling me that they just received notice that their building was going to be sold and that they were scared that they were going to be displaced because who knows if the new owner comes in, they could have raised the rent by 10, 15, 20 percent. So I quickly uh, set up a meeting with the county executive. And long story short, um, we were able to secure $70 million, 70, 70 million dollars uh, to purchase the building yesterday with Enterprise, which is a nonprofit that deals with housing. Um, and it was amazing the power of, of people. When you speak up, you do have power. These folks don't even speak English. So we had the meeting. It took forever because we had to translate everything. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, that's the beauty of living in this county. You know, these stories. Uh, it doesn't happen every day, but it does happen here. And I put value on that. So on the housing bill, again, on Monday, uh, under the chairmanship, of Ocan o Council Vice President Andrew Fritzson and his committee. We're going to be uh, working together, Will and I, with Andrew, uh, to get consensus and pass something that will be permanent in terms of rent uh, increases uh, that won't hit double digits. That's important. Um, and then move on and also do it in a way that is responsible to continue building more housing, especially deeply affordable housing in this county. That's it. Enough. Great, thank you so much, council members. So we do have some more questions virtual, so I'm gonna go ahead and toss it to my colleague, Mershai Salu, for some virtual questions. We'll be back here in person. Mershai, to you. Thank you, Jordan. Our next question comes from Mark Curie. Mark, you can ask your question when you're ready. Okay, if he's not connecting, I can go ahead and ask his question in the chat. He asks, my question concerns Vision Zero action, specifically why is the county undermining the Vision Zero effort by creating road hazards through poor road maintenance oversight and sloppy construction practices? Okay, which council member would like to answer that? Okay. Uh, I, uh, so thank you very much for the question. As chair of the Transportation and, in, and Environment Committee, this is something that, uh, that I and, and all of my colleagues um, have spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, the tragic fatalities that are happening on our roads and the number of people who are being hit while simply walking or biking. Um, I'm looking at my notes right here because we are in the middle of July and as of today, there have been 269 Montgomery County residents hit while walking or biking, and six people have been tragically killed. And we're just about halfway through the year. That is why we're doing this work, to make sure that our kids are able to get home safely from school, to make sure that seniors are able to walk around their neighborhood and make sure that our roads are safe 
for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and yes, for drivers. And in this last budget, uh, we made sure that there was funding for road improvement because we need our roads to be operational for everybody. We want them to be safe for everybody. And that is what we've been doing with our Vision Zero efforts. I'll turn it over to Council Member Balcom, who's also on the Transportation and Environment Committee. Um, thank you. And this is such an important question. Uh, what I would I would say the number one constituent question we get is about road safety, uh, crosswalks, stop signs, um, infrastructure, and uh, we absolutely need to look at our the investment into road maintenance. Um, we and we need to have as a new council member, I need to have a, a more thorough understanding of the priorities because sometimes it seems like a mystery, certainly to me, and I'm and I can imagine to our constituents as to uh, when a road comes up for maintenance and how that happens and really how much investment we need to make. Um, tragically, we uh, had a death in our community of a of a middle school child crossing the street. We just need to do much better. Uh, we're looking at, we have a bill in front of us, uh, the Safe Streets Act, uh, where any time um, a pedestrian has a collision in a school zone, we need to look at the infrastructure. Uh, we need to look to make sure that um, the road isn't contributing to these collisions. And so, uh, the, we're committed to, to making that happen. And I think that what the first thing that we need to find out from our Montgomery County DOT is um, what is the process and um, what is the investment that we need to make. Thank you. Turn it over to Council Member Albernaz and then Katz. So thank you for the question. This is a public health issue uh, and as Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, it needs to be treated as such. And while there is complexity in that we're talking about state roads, local roads, sometimes municipal with county roads, um, there's no question that we need to do more that we have done. There is some good news coming. Our colleagues in the planning department will be sending over a pedestrian master plan very shortly for the council to be able to review. That plan will comprehensively look at pedestrian walkways across the entire county and makes recommendations to help ensure that those are safe. I have four kids, all under the age of 15. They all ride their bikes. And I would be lying if I said I didn't think or worry about every time they go out if something's going to happen to them. We shouldn't live like that. And we can balance these things. We also have to work more closely, frankly, with our state legislature. And we do have a governor who is now deeply committed and a lieutenant governor who used to be a, a, a traffic engineer with our own county department of transportation and very much understands these issues. So I'm actually very optimistic that the political will and the actions that the council has taken over the last 10 years to address Vision Zero issues are in the best position we have been in a long time to come to fruition. Thank you very much for that question as well. The, you know, uh, it, it was, it's been mentioned that this was a transportation issue, this is a health and uh, human services issue, but this is also, I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee, this is obviously a public safety issue. And by the way, it's a, an education issue as well. It affects each one of us. But the point that I wanted to make is please do not wait to let us know of a concern. You don't need to wait for a town hall meeting to let us know of a specific site or a specific problem. Every one of us, each each council member has a has a, uh, a a very fine office. I know all of their staffs, and all of them want to help. If you will call our office or email us, we with specifics. If it's at the corner of X and Y, it helps us realize where we need to be fixing something. Please do not wait. Let us know much sooner rather than later, and please. Let us help you. Please help us help you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and I told you that this is a, an issue that is uh, 
deeply personal to, to all of us on the council, so much so that uh, everybody here has co-sponsored the Safe Streets Act, which is legislation I introduced, uh, and that if you are interested in learning more about it, the Transportation and Environment Committee has a work session on June 29th at 1.30, so you can follow that online. Great, thank you so much. Another virtual question, Rashai, to you. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Rosalind Hansen. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for answering my question. I appreciate it. Okay, so my question is, while the County Council does not control curriculum approved by MCPS Board of Education, you do have authority to remove a board member for immorality, misconduct in office, incompetence, or willful neglect of duty. My question is when is this council starting the process to remove Lynn Harris from the Board of Education in response to her public comments mocking the religious beliefs of MCPS students and accusing parents of teaching hate? Can we hold our applause, everybody, just so we can hear the answer? Thank you so much. Council Member Ludke. Hi, thank you for your question. Um, I just want to clarify, though, the authority to remove a Board of Education member rests with the state, not with the county council, not with any of the county's uh, local governing authorities. So we do have the fiscal authority uh, over their budget. We do not control curriculum content, as we was mentioned earlier. Um, but remember, the, the state board is the the higher ma'am that's not over true ma'am that's not true at all I'm if sorry, i look at the board of education handbook it specifically says pursuant to statute the montgomery county council may remove a board member for immorality misconduct of office incompetence or willful neglect of duty you absolutely have it pursuant to state code so i would recommend you check in the state's education article which sets forth how boards of education are structured and the removal well then our board of education's information and their entire handbook is inaccurate that may be true. I can't speak to that. I don't serve on the Board of Education, and I did not write their handbook. But I can tell you that the Maryland Annotated Code Education article specifies how the boards are structured, their functions, and removal authority. Thanks. Great. Thank you. We'll go ahead and take some questions here in person. I'm going to look around to see if we have any questions, OK? Yes, sir. You, I'll have to hold the mic for you. You can go ahead and stand and tell me your name and state your question. Thank you. Thank you so, much. so uh, my name is Ian Big. I'm born and raised here in Montgomery County in Silver Spring. And then now I live in Germantown. I love this county. It's a great county. It's always been amazing. And I think you guys are doing an amazing job on all these fronts. I truly do. Um, but. You know, there's always been this thing in common in America and in Montgomery County. It wasn't so prevalent, but it is, and it was. This, it, it's always been Islamophobic, right? If you say something about anyone, it's, you're canceled. But if you say something about a Muslim, it's, you get a high five. And that's how it's been. Chris and Mink recently called us all Islamophobes and outright bigots. Nancy, uh, Lynn Harris. Is Sir, I'll just ask if you keep it respectful, okay, and just concise, but I will let, definitely let you answer your, ask your question, okay? okay, okay. Thank I, you so okay. much. Okay, I was not disrespectful. I just said facts. That really happened. It was on, it was on the news. Everybody saw oh, that. That's fine. It's a fact. Um, anyways, uh, Lynn Harris called, uh, said that uh, Muslim children speaking their own mind are uh, parroting dogma. So a lot of, what I'm hearing from a lot of people is like, okay, if we don't, if we, if we remove the opt-out option, a child who is being depicted in the book is going to be sad. And that's, and, and that's what everyone's base, like, that's what it's coming down to, right? That's what it all comes down to. So, I mean, no one, and, and, and this is just like crazy town because I don't understand why doesn't anyone look at the Muslim kid and say, oh, that kid's got feelings. And let me tell you why. Because according to the news and everything, you've all been brainwashed to believe that I am Osama bin Laden and every Muslim. Is Do you have a question, oh, no. sir? I just ask that you be respectful. Okay, what is your question? What is your question? Okay, what's your question? So, so um, my question is, see, that, and that's part of what I'm talking about, is, is trained in people's minds to not let us speak, not let us talk, not let us tell you what's really on our mind. So, 
that's the problem. I want y'all to come out to the mudges and see us because trust me, I don't beat my wife. I don't veil her. I don't force her to dress a certain way. I'm not abusive to my children. I'm, this, the, the image of Islam that you have in your mind that I hate America, it's not true. I love my community. I'm always doing charitable works. I'm always out there trying to help people. I'm helping. You know what I do on the side? I have a minivan. I move furniture for people. I tell people, okay, if you're moving your house, let me help you. I know that's an expensive charge, so let me help you. I help them move the furniture. So I, what I'm trying to say is that we're not bad people. Can you think about my child's feelings too? Because if he knows he's not supposed to, because we have a different look on this thing. And if you come to us and you ask us what it is, you'll see what it is. You may not like it, but you'll know that that's, what we're, that's where we're coming from. That's who we are. That's who we've been for thousands of years. And so for today, the people to just tell us, okay, no, we are going to force you to do this thing because we care about this child's feelings, but we don't give a damn about your child. We don't give a damn about you. We don't give a damn about where you came from. Go back to where you came from. They told us, they literally told us, put your kids in a private Islamic school. That really, Mr. Will, that really sounds like go back to Africa, which is something we heard a lot growing up. In Sir, do you have a sir. question? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? Just please, I, I just be respectful. Question, I'm not, I'm not okay, been, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do you, are mad. you done? Thank you Very, so much. Thank you, I, thank you. I, I, we appreciate this conversation. The reason we are here and the reason we conduct these events is to have face-to-face -face conversations, screen-to-screen -screen conversations. And one of the most things I love about Montgomery County is we have 1.1 million people who live here. And that means we have 1.1 million different ideas about how to make this community the best it can be. And the only way we're going to achieve some commonality is through conversation. And we might not always agree. But it is my hope and the hope of everybody here on the table that we can disagree without being disagreeable. But at the core, we have to have the conversation. So we welcome the conversation. We know that you will continue having the conversation and it will be continued beyond this forum tonight. Great, thank you. We'll take another question, a show of hands in the audience. Uh, uh, Jordan, Jordan. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Mink, go ahead. Yeah. I. I appreciate your question. I truly do. I, I appreciate the passion. Um, I, I pr appreciate that this is an issue that you care deeply about. That is a you're bringing a you know a faith-based concern. I, I I truly appreciate that, and it is a conversation that I think is important too. Um, and I'm glad that I'm glad that you're here to have it. Um, and um, I I do want to clarify, if I may. Um, I do want to uh, first. I apologize for. Hurt, you know, hurt that I clearly caused, and I'm, and for that I am sorry. Um, and okay. Oh, can I repeat what I just said? Oh yes. I, okay. So no, I'm not going to repeat what I said at the Board of Education because that I think caused a lot of problems. But um, but I but I will note in regards to and this ties back to um, your point about conversations, which I think is is so important. Um, as Council President Glass noted, um, you know when I arrived at the at the Board of Education, and um, you know I had been brought there from by uh, you know an event listing that that uh, had been shown to me that had been produced by an SPLC identified hate group. When I arrived there, I saw in fact community members, many of, of my Muslim community members, and I was like, okay, this is a this is actually a whole different thing and I need to sit down and have conversations because I completely agree with, with everything that you just said about that, the importance of that. And so, um, you know, those community members were very welcoming to me um, and were, when I asked if I could sit down and hear their perspectives prior to the Board of Education um, meeting um, and hear their perspectives, they absolutely said yes and come on and come sit down with us. And we had a, you know, a, a real back and forth conversation there while well, mostly listening. Um, but I was really moved by that conversation. Um, and it was very clear to me that folks were speaking from their hearts, that they were talking about their families, um, that certainly this was not a conversation that was, that was coming from you know, a, a negative place. Um, and so I agree with you that words are important, and clearly that's a big lesson learned for me. 
Um, and um, it certainly is not my intention to create more division with my words, um, which, I, which I did, and I apologize. Um, you know, I was, I was so moved by those conversations that I had prior to the testimonies that I actually scrapped what I was going to say, and I said, you know, I'll, 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 speak, I'll speak to this, because it was noted there how when we broad brush with words like, you know, hatred, um, then, uh, you know, we're really, we're really broad brushing over many of our community members who are attempting to engage in a real meaningful conversation and speak from the heart, and that's not what we, that's not what we want to do, and it's not accurate. Um, so, uh, you know, that was my effort was to say, I know we've got a couple that we, we have, you know, there was that hate group that sent out the thing, there were a few folks there, but we also have, more importantly, we have many of our Muslim community members who are here to engage in a conversation, and we cannot broad brush um, and, and lump those folks together. We have to be um, able and willing to sit down and to really listen and to hear, and so that was, that was the intent um, of my words was to say, I know that the, the, you know, there's multiple groups here, um, but we have to see, we have to differentiate we have to talk differently, engage differently, um, and have these real conversations. Um, and I know that the way it came across to, to many people and, and the way that it was presented was, was very different. Um, but I, I can assure you that I see those as, as very different entities, and I am open to, again, we don't have jurisdiction over this, but just as, as kind of a general thing, I think that engaging in hard conversations is a thing that we do to bring our communities together and to create understanding. And again, although the County Council doesn't have jurisdiction over this particular issue, um, I continue to welcome the conversation, and I appreciate your, your voice on the matter. Great, thank you so much. Okay, by a show of hands, I'm gonna go ahead and round. Okay, I see a gentleman here. How are you? Fine, how are you? So I'll just read this question. <clears throat> There's been some discussion on traffic safety tonight, and I'd like to highlight in that vein the, that a recent OLO report found racial disparities in police interactions. Black people are pulled over more than other drivers, and these stops can easily escalate into violent consequences. How does the council plan to address this problem in a sustainable manner? First up. Turn it over to the, the chair of the Public Safety Committee and then the Council Member Juwanda, the sponsor of the legislation you're referring Thank to. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, Council Member Juwanda was going to tell you about a bill that is pending at this point, though there is some question whether the Montgomery County Council has authority to have, to, uh, have authority over uh, uh, that legislation. Uh, we're, we're awaiting um, information. Uh, but we certainly, no one wants any person to feel uncomfortable in Montgomery County. We want everyone to feel safe and we want everyone to, to, uh, uh, to, to realize that they too uh, certainly uh, need to be here and want to be, and we want them to be here. Having said that, we also want to make certain that our police officers um, are, are a part that they reflect the, the uh, uh, Montgomery County's uh, demographic as, demographics as well. We are trying our level best to get more and more uh, people to join the police force. Uh, in fact, just recently, for the first time in, in history, Montgomery County is offering a $20,000 bonus for someone to, to, uh, to sign up to become a police officer in Montgomery County. We, we didn't, we've never done that before, but our competition has done that, so consequently, we are doing that as well. We are trying our best to attract people who we want to have as police officers, be police officers. It's not an easy job, but it's a necessary job. And with that, I'll turn it over to Council Member Jawando. Thank you, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, everyone deserves to feel and be safe in their community. Um, and in a community as large as ours, you know, that, that is something that's a challenge. I think you're seeing in the conversation we're having tonight, depending on who you are and where you are, you experience things in this county differently. And that's just a fact, you know. Uh, and, but it also creates a great opportunity. And I think we've led on a lot of policies to help address that. Uh, I, I introduced with Councilmember Mink uh, the Safety and Traffic Equity and Policing Act, uh, which would focus our police on these, uh, something we talked about earlier. Uh, the, we normally in a given year have double the amount of traffic uh, deaths and pedestrian deaths that we do homicides in our county. It is a true emergency. And the, those are due to speeding, reckless driving, driving under the influence, and the like. 
running red lights and stop signs. Um, and so I want our traffic safety efforts to focus on those things. And the STEP Act would focus police traffic enforcement on those things and not have them be pulling people over for a air freshener or a tinted window or a, a uh, tail light that's out or an expired registration. Those would be secondary offenses. Uh, and this has been passed in other communities across the country in, in North Carolina, led with police enforcement, leading this. We're going to have a lunch and learn, actually. We have 30 people signed up to hear from people across the country who have done this type of policy to focus our resources. It's supported by the Vision Zero National Network. It's supported by the Washington Area and Bicyclists Association, as well as civil rights groups like the NAACP and CASA and others. Uh, we have to be leading on policies like this, um, and we're going to take it up uh, in the Public Safety Committee. We're obviously getting a, a hearing from the Attorney General, uh, but I think we need to be moving in that direction. We've asked our police to do too much, uh, and to everything from the cat in the tree to violent crime, and we need to focus them on the most urgent things in our community, uh, and that's what I think this bill is a part of. So we're going to have that discussion at the Council. At the same time, reducing the disparities, which are very stark, uh, for people of color being pulled over for low-level traffic offenses. Thank you. I appreciate those explanations, and, and as has been noted, uh, a majority of the council has asked for the Maryland Attorney General, Anthony Brown, to weigh in as to whether or not the council has jurisdiction over this, and so uh, there's no further action right now until we hear from the Attorney General about what we are able to do. Uh, uh, Council Member Ludke has a comment. Yes, uh, I wanted to apologize and clarify because I sit here, that's what I've been doing on my phone, I've been looking it up. We are different than many of the other boards of education. We can, in fact, new power, didn't know we had it, so we do. Um, so it's section 3-901 of the Maryland Education Article does allow us to remove a Board of Education member. We do have, there's notice provisions, timing provisions, charges that we can bring. Um, and uh, guidelines for when someone could be removed from office. Um, that's not something that's pending before the council presently. Um, and there is an appellate right in the circuit court for Montgomery County of any action taken by the council. So I hope that answered the question that was posed earlier. And now I know how we in Montgomery County like to do things differently. Here we go. Great. Thank you so much for the explanation. Um, I just want to let everybody here know we are trying to get to everybody as much as we can. As you see, there's a lot of people here, but right now I'm going to go ahead and toss it back to virtual and then we'll come back in person. Again, we are trying to get to everybody here. With that being said, I'm going to toss it to Mershai via Zoom and then we'll come back in person, okay? And I'm going to try my best to get to everybody. Mershai, to you. Thank you, Jordan. Our next question comes from Rosa Greenberg. Hi, my name is Rosa and I live in District 6. My question is about public health. Will you create universal masking protections in healthcare in our county? I and other high risk people cannot currently safely access healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. Thank you for that question. So, obviously, um, COVID required unprecedented measures taken by local jurisdictions across the country as we dealt with the chaos and confusion related to a global pandemic. And under a statute, the county sitting as the Board of Health, under the provision of the designation of an emergency, which was issued by our governor for well over a year and a half and then extended by an additional nine months, gave local council members the ability uh, to enact masking requirements while we were in the midst of the global pandemic. Um, that is no longer the case. We are no longer in an emergency status. Um, and while I very much understand and respect your concern, uh, the council does not have the authority currently, uh, nor do I believe it's necessary systemically across the board for us to enact that particular legislation. Private businesses, organizations, and county government does have the opportunity to instill masking requirements but we don't have the authority to issue it system-wide across the county. Great, thank you, Mershaya. I think we have another question via Zoom. Yes, our next question comes from Sandy DeWine. I'll ask the question in the interest of time. That, that's okay, I got it. All right. Um, I asked several questions. I'm not sure which one you have chosen. 
And I, I would like to ask how the questions are selected. What's the criteria? If somebody wouldn't mind answering. Ma'am, did you have a specific question for this evening that you wanted to ask the council member? You can go ahead and ask one of those questions. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I do have several. I'm concerned about fire safety in high rises, especially after the big fire in Silver Spring. I also live in an older high rise. And I recall there were reports that the fire alarms didn't work on the floor that was affected at the arrive apartments. How do tenants find out fire marshals reports about their buildings? Do we have the right to access that information? For instance, my building just had its triennial inspection. Are we able to see that? Because management doesn't really communicate. And I find when they do inspections, the maintenance people don't really check the fire alarm in your unit like they're supposed to. And, you know, it's kind of scary. Thank you very much, Sandy, for that question. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Stewart, who was there at the arrive moments after that fire started. Great. Thank you, Sandy, for that question. The safety in our high rises is a top priority for us. And one of the things that we learned after the arrive fire is that that was one of about 70 buildings that we have in Montgomery County, high rises that does not have a sprinkler system. And I want to thank Council Vice President Andrew Friedson, who held a committee session with the fire marshal who came and our director of our Department of Housing and Community, as well as our new director of permitting and a number of people who discussed the very issues that you raised today. So first, I am a strong proponent of looking at how we can assist building owners to make sure that sprinklers are available in apartment buildings. I know it is expensive, but I think that is one thing that we can look at here in the county, how we can do that. In addition, our D20, our District 20 state delegate, Lorik Sharkoudian, did have a bill in Annapolis this year. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but that bill was called the Sprinkler Save Live, the Melanie Diaz bill, and that would specifically help us move forward in ensuring that there were sprinklers in our high rises. To your question regarding inspections, you should be able to receive those reports. Buildings are inspected by the fire marshal. That comes under, as our chair of public safety was just saying to me, comes under permitting and our housing department. And we're more than happy to follow up with you and answer any concerns you have or if you're having any trouble getting the last fire marshal's report for your building. And again, I just want to thank Council Vice President Friedson. And I know these are going to be ongoing conversations we have because that session we had looking back at the Arai fire did raise a number of questions that we all had in terms of how we're ensuring fire safety. And I think it was Council Member Balcom who particularly emphasized the need to make sure that we're educating our residents on fire safety, and that is a top priority for us. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. We'll take an in-person question. Just a friendly reminder, if we don't get to you, please send your questions, and we will try to get those answered. I had this lady here with her hand raised. If you don't have to stand, then that's okay, but I'll hold the mic for you. Yes, ma'am. I'll hold the mic for you, okay? First of all, I want to thank Kate for her kindness in coming and talking to us at the Blairs. I live at Blair East. I've lived there for over 20 years. My question, excuse me, relates to the pending legislation on rent stabilization. There's another element that really hasn't been discussed. Many Montgomery County renters who might be on disability payments or other benefits cannot, excuse me, their level of income may raise by $100, making them ineligible 
for the current uh, levels that are required to get subsidized apartments. That's a very serious problem because suddenly they're thrown into the open market and they cannot afford to stay in the same house. So access to the subsidized apartment is very important. I know you have required new developers to have um, some uh, moderate income housing, but it, the income levels aren't really realistic. And I think you have to evaluate them because many of the disability payments are linked to cost of living. And if they go up, suddenly the renter finds themselves unable to meet the standard required by the Housing Opportunities Commission. And additionally, I would hope that the Housing Opportunities Commission would make it easier for people to get applications, understand the application process, and maybe hold public meetings like this, for which I'm very grateful, in the different parts of the county so that people could come and ask questions and fill out forms right there instead of going to an apartment house and being told, oh, we're filled up. But if you write to the Housing Commission, you'll, or you go online and you can get an application, that's not adequate in a county like this. You've got to help people. Thank you very much for taking my question. Th thank you for the very thorough and, and thoughtful question. I'll turn it over to Vice President Friedson. Thank you so much for that question. A few parts to it. So first of all, your last point, which is a terrific one. I'm happy to follow up with the Housing Opportunities Commission to make that specific suggestion because it is a very good one to do uh, proactive outreach and to allow for forms to be filled out in real time with support of staff. Uh, to your point about the broad spectrum of affordability, as I was talking about earlier, the various efforts that the county has undertaken, particularly over the last five years, we have really tried to focus on all levels of affordability. We need more housing, more new housing. We need more affordable housing. We need more workforce housing. We need more deeply affordable housing. We need all of it. It's a yes and challenge, and we really have tried to address that. And so most of the efforts that we have undertaken have been not just at the 65, 70% area median income, it's 30 to 50% as well of area median income and 50 to 70%, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a wide breadth of that. Uh, uh, as well, you heard uh, Natalie Fanny Gonzalez talk about uh, the project that she uh, and the county executive and uh, Department of Housing and Community Affairs have been working on. Uh, that project is something called a ROFR, a right of first refusal, and the county has been exercising uh, that uh, more and more. Uh, the goal there is to take a building that is going to be sold on the private market and allow the county or the Housing Opportunities Commission to come in and buy it and either assign it to a nonprofit or the Housing Opportunities Commission to keep it on their own and maintain it at levels of affordability that can have those deep levels of affordability as a key part of our affordability uh, strategy and our preservation strategy. The nonprofit fund that I mentioned earlier, the $50 million fund that we've been working on for several years, the, the whole purpose of that fund will be specifically at preservation, to look at existing naturally occurring affordable housing and making sure that we can take it into public ownership and preserve those rents and those uh, rental levels for years and for decades to come. There are a lot of other tools that we use, like uh, 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 rental agreements with existing naturally occurring affordable housing, like you're talking about that existing housing stock, to get an agreement from a private property owner to agree to rent at a certain affordable level that is much lower uh, even than MPDU level or at MPDU level uh, in order to do it. But we need more. The challenge is, is the numbers. We have a lot more people who need levels of affordability than we have units, and so we have to continue to uh, add more housing and preserve more housing. Uh, and, and it's 8.32. I'm going to let Council Member Sales get the final word here. Well, thank you, President Glass, and thank you for your question. Uh, when I was in the city of Gaithersburg, I was the liaison to the seniors in the community. And following the pandemic, a lot of our communities, especially our hospitality 
businesses had to pivot and be restructured and redeveloped to actually accommodate affordable housing projects. And so that's why my first priority was to create legislation that would increase and accelerate how and um, how, where, how fast we build affordable housing. And that's why I introduced the ZTA that Council Vice President Gla um, Friedson mentioned, the OPEN Act, which is Opening Pathways of Economic Necessity, we passed the Thrive um, Visioning Plan that uh, prioritizes 15-minute communities. And 15-minute communities are mixed-use communities where you live, work, play, and enjoy. And we have had the, um, you know, you know these uh, bad uh, negative uh, sayings about um, how projects get built and how long it takes. And so um, I want to um, attract developers who are going to bring those projects that are going to increase our affordable housing, not just at the MPDU level, but at the deeply affordable housing level, because we know that seniors are living on fixed income, the young families are college graduates. As I was knocking doors across this county, I was talking with students who graduated and were still living in their parents' basement. My daughter had to come back home as well because it's just unaffordable. And so I'm doing everything I can to ensure that we prioritize affordable housing, that we increase the rental assistance that's available, we increase pathways to home ownership with the state and federal levels. And so we wanna ensure that we don't have anyone experiencing homelessness. And so if there are issues that you know about, we have our senior advisory committee at the county level um, that's been very proactive and is always looking for um, vocal members. So if you need any information, please, I'll make sure you get one of my cards to connect you. Um, and we're gonna be meeting with the villages soon as well. That's the virtual senior communities that were bolstered during, during the pandemic um, and continue to be vocal advocates on a range of issues from health and human services to food insecurity and housing and transportation and a number of other issues. So thank you Great. so much. Thank you, thank you so much. And it looks like we're actually out of time, but don't worry, council members will still be here and be able to answer some questions. I understand that, just calm down. I understand, sir, I understand. I just want to let y'all know something, sir. I understand that. If we if we don't get to your questions, we will be reaching out individually with answers at a later date. Okay? We're going to toss it to Council President Glass for closing remarks. Thank you so much. I, I know I know that a number of people still have questions. Uh, this this is part of our ongoing conversation. Uh, we do these uh, regularly throughout the community. And we are all accessible, not only by emailing, by calling our offices, by scheduling meetings, by communicating with us on social media. But at the core of our work here in the county, it is all about having a dialogue. And as I noted before, there are 1.1 million people here in Montgomery County. We love our diversity, and that also means we have different opinions. And it is my hope it is the hope of my colleagues that as we continue to engage about how we can make this place the best it can be, we can share our opinions, but hopefully we don't always have to be disagreeable while disagreeing. And I think that is the best way that we as a community can move forward. Let's continue that conversation, and thank you all for joining us this evening.